Uh, we're going to start our talks again now. Um, I'm going to be hearing from Brandon Isles, uh, one of the co-founders of Ampleforth. Um, he's going to be speaking on uh, Intro to Ampleforth, Ampleforth's multi-chain vision, uh, and how Ampleforth works with ChainSafe to execute on it. Um, greetings, Brandon. Um, hey, yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, can you all hear me and see me? Let's see. Um, hey, yeah, so uh, happy to be here. Really excited. Um, I think. Uh, you know, ChainSafe is doing some really cool stuff to enable like the whole uh, multi-chain you know, landscape in front of us. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ample. Uh, I'll, the first part, I'll talk about the project, um, what we're doing, where we're going. Um, then I'll talk about how Ample and uh, we see it working across, you know, multiple chains, you know, simultaneously. And then specifically how we're working with ChainBridge to sort of help make that happen. I'll go into pretty deep um, architecture stuff too. So um, stick around if you're interested in the more technical side. Uh, but first, <clears throat> I'll start more high level, which is a little bit more you know economics related. Um, so first, you know what is Ample? Um, Ample is a base money digital currency um, with an elastic supply. Um, so what that means is it's you know it's uncollateralized, you know similar to to Bitcoin. You know it doesn't rely on on collateral or the value of any outside asset, um, and it has an elastic supply. Um, that adjusts every day according to demand in the marketplace. Um, so from a very high level, you know, if the the current price of Ample is above the price target, that means we need to increase supply. And when the uh, price on the market of Ample is below the price target, it means we need to decrease supply in order to point the, the system back towards the uh, equilibrium price target. So what this does is it gives you uh, you know, two qualities uh, of money that we've never really seen together before um, in the same place. So one has, um, it's, it's non-dilutive, right? So the, the unique way in which we adjust supply is that everyone uh, in the world has equal standing. So when new supply gets created, it goes towards everyone proportional to what they own. And when new supply... But uh, the screen that you're sharing is not your slide. That's what you intended. Oh, okay. Um, so maybe just uh, hit share screen again and it'll give you an option to choose a different window. Okay. Maybe I'll just share the, the window. Perfect. Um, okay. Great. Um, sorry. Here we go. Um, Right. So we have, uh, so Ample has two qualities. So you don't normally see together. Or we've never seen together. So one is non-dilutive, meaning that if you own, you know, 1% of the network, you always own 1% unless you decide to buy or sell. Um, you know, this is sort of the soundness property that everyone, you know, likes so much about Bitcoin um, and, you know, commodities and precious metals and that sort of thing. Uh, but it also has a long run uh, equilibrium price target, meaning that it unlocks a sort of unit of account. Um, and this is especially useful um, for, you know, contract denomination and denomination of debt, right? So um, here's a very simple example of where, uh, you know, Ample being used as base money could lead to a sort of safer sort of uh, system of finance above it. So um, imagine Alice and Bob just enter into a bet. So Alice bets Bob that the Lakers will get into the 2021 uh, NBA semifinals. Um, if they do, then Alice will pay Bob, you know, 10 coins. You know, otherwise, Bob will pay Alice 10 coins. So <clears throat> if, if uh, Alice and Bob were to use something like Bitcoin, um, they're exposed to the volatility of, of this asset, right? So if I bet you, you know, 10 Bitcoin uh, to be paid back a year from now, um, neither of us know how much that's going to be worth in terms of raw purchasing power. So whoever has to pay that might be on the hook for much more than they expect that can lead to default. You know, there's a high risk of default and the more volatile this asset is, the higher that risk would be. Um, now, the neat thing about Ample is that when you denominate with the unit of account, 
no matter what happens to the overall ample supply, you always know how much you're going to be on the hook for, you know, for your obligation, right? So if you if you owe, let's see, 10 amples, um, even if the overall supply of ample and, and market cap went way up or way down, you're still going to be paying back you know, 10 amples, which is roughly 10 2019 US dollars. So the price target of ample um, is the 2019 US dollar um, to maintain a sort of constant purchasing power through time. Um, so people often use the word stablecoin around our project, but we don't really view ourselves as a stablecoin. Um, uh, so you know, today's stablecoins, you know, they either you know, there are two main types. They're, there's the ones that rely on you know, the U.S. dollar sitting in a bank account somewhere, um, or there's the sort of collateralized stablecoins. Um, so it, so uh, stablecoins like Tether, USDC, they rely on centralized banking relationships. Um, and uh, you know, the the idea, hopefully, of you know all the work that we're doing in the sort of decentralized sphere and blockchain world is to sort of um, remove the reliance on these private relationships uh, to remove the needed trust. Right? Um, uh, so yeah, the, we kind of view the goal of, of um, centralized finance and, and blockchains as being able to create a sort of new monetary system that's beyond the reach of politics. And so we want to remove those layers of trust as much as possible. Um, and the other types of stable coins uh, that people tend to think about next are the sort of collateralized stable coins. Um, and so debt derived monies, you know, can't rely completely on, you know, free market incentives alone. And, uh, you know, if they rely on lenders of last resort, then they also, you know, rely on periodic bailouts, which we've seen through history, you know, over and over again. So I think there is, there is a risk of um, us, you know, recreating the history of finance and having every everything play out exactly the way it has before, um, except maybe in a petri dish rather than, than uh, a different sphere. Um, and so, Ampleforth is an attempt to do something different—a sort of new new formulation of, of money that can give us a sort of safe, resilient um, financial uh, infrastructure um, without having to rely on these, these weaknesses that we've seen before. Um, so, before I get into um, the multi-chain architecture, I can still talk about how it works on, on a single chain. Um, so uh, right now we're, we're deployed on Ethereum. Um, we, we started this project um, in early 2018. Uh, so we've been working on it for a good long time now. Um, it first went live in the summer of 2019. Um, and so we, we have, you know, a year and a half's worth of, of market activity that, that we can look at. Um, uh, we're currently deployed onto Ethereum because um, that was sort of the the most uh, used and most established uh, you know platform out there um, with a lot of developer activity. Uh, when we first started the project, um, we made the uh, at the time somewhat controversial decision to not build our own blockchain. Um, so instead of creating our own silo and asking people to come to us, uh, we decided that we would instead. And I go to where people are already you know, storing value or making transactions or creating contracts. Right? Um, so we decided to deploy um, on top of on top of Ethereum. So these are, these are the main components of the system. Um, Ample is a token that you know, implements the ERC twenty template functions. Um, so it's it's tradable just like any other ERC twenty. There are balances, there are transfer functions, um, but the ERC twenty is um, directed by a supply policy. So supply policy is another contract also deployed on Ethereum. Um, and what that does is that examines the data that comes in through our Oracle system and then calculates how to adjust the supply. Uh, so the supply adjustment happens once a day. It's called the rebase. So if you've heard of you know rebase tokens, um, it's been a kind of air, area of interest or curiosity recently. Um, ample ample for this project that sort of introduced the concept of you know elastic tokens or re rebase tokens to the world of decentralized finance. Um, and so uh, the monetary policy once a day has this rebase function that takes in uh, data from two different oracles. It has um, a market oracle and then a CPI oracle. So the market oracle provides the 24 hour volume weighted average price of ample in the marketplace. And then the CPI oracle, takes in a measure of consumer price index um, that allows us to um, 
target not the current day's US dollar, but the dollar at a particular point in time. So we're we target the 2019 US dollar, you know, the day of you know the network live, um, so that we can uh, have a, a steady level of you know target purchasing power without having to be exposed to the natural devaluation that happens from the tools available to uh, you know existing central banks. Um, so it's fairly simple, three main components, the oracles, the supply policy, and the token contract, the ERC-20. Um, now the rebase function is a publicly callable function, so anyone can poke this as long as it's within the time window, and it can only occur you know, at most once a day. Um, all right, so ample fourth across chains. So a, a, a monetary asset is um, defined by two qualities. It's defined by the nature of its scarcity, and it's defined by its use value. Um, so those two things is, are what make, you know, say, um, Bitcoin different from ETH, right? So uh, the nature of scarcity of Bitcoin is it has, you know, a, a supply ceiling of, uh, you know, that it will never go beyond. Um, and then it has no use value aside from being able to pay for transactions on the Bitcoin network. Um, you know, ETH, uh, is scarcity is determined by its, um, you know, emission from, from the miners um, or staking rewards in the case of ETH2. And then the, the use value is that you can use ETH to pay for computation on the distributed computational platform. Um, so for Ample, the nature of the scarcity is the supply policy and, and the rebase function curve. And then the use value is it's a pure monetary asset similar to Bitcoin where there's there's no non-monetary use. And so there's there's no sort of outside source of bias in, in the value of an individual Ample. It's purely its monetary value. So uh, when you think about Ample um, existing across multiple chains, as long as Ample is on chain A and Ample is on chain B respond to the same monetary policy, as long as you can freely transfer Ample is back and forth then they're all the same Ample, right? So when we think about Ample on multiple chains or multiple chain ecosystems, um, we're not doing parallel deployments um, on, on each chain individually in different silos. These are all the same Ample uh, uh, controlled by the same monetary policy. Um, so even going back to the single chain architecture, right? So um, can imagine a ERC-20 existing on lots of chains, um, but the monetary policy and the Oracle only really need to exist in one place. So ideally, you know, those would exist on the chain with the highest level of decentralization. Um, it does a low volume of work. And so the cost of these operations is, is not that much of a concern. Um, instead, we care about security and, and decentralization. Um, and the ERC-20s um, can exist in lots of places. Uh, so on on a remote chain, we might have a deployment of the ERC-20. It gets rebase um, instructions over, over a bridge. But even on the same chain, we could conceivably have two different ERC-20s. For, like we could have the existing um, ERC-20 Ample. We could also conceivably have a uh, privacy version of Ample, right, that uses like um, zero knowledge proofs. So maybe you can use um, the privacy version of Ample on Ethereum um, to get privacy, but you have to pay higher gas costs to do that, right? So this is an example of two different um, contracts um, being controlled by the same monetary policy that's still all ample. Um, so that's, that's the high level of how we think about ample across multiple chains. Um, I'll dive into the, the architecture and how it's all gonna work and how we're gonna work with chain safe here too. Uh, so this, this diagram is um, a generic bridge, right? So you have one chain on the left and then one chain on the right. Um, there's, you know, a handler on one side. So say you called a function on that handler that would write to the logs, the, uh, you know, relayers would pick up the events from those logs and then, you know, report it to the handler on uh, the other uh, target chain, right? So as long as enough relayers, uh, write the report and it's confirmed, then it calls this you know, callback function that executes the function on the other side of, of the bridge. Um, so it um, should be pretty simple. Um, Chainbridge has uh, some, some existing handlers for like ERC-20s, and then also has some handlers for generic data passing or transaction function calls. 
Um, so even though Ample you know, implements the ERC-20 functions, we decided to go with the generic handlers rather than the ERC-20s. Um, it should become clear when, when we get there. Um, so really, there, there's two jobs that we wanted the bridge to handle. One is transfer amples, and then two is to uh, marshal the rebase calls. So here's how a transfer works. Um, so there, there's a lot going on here, but hopefully I can walk you through, and hopefully it's visible. Um, so it starts here um, with the depositor, the little elastic figure um, on the bottom left side of the screen. Um, so uh, this person decides that he wants to send uh, some ample from you know one chain to another chain, right? So he initiates a transfer, uh, say 100 ample. Um, so this 100 ample um, gets sent to, or the, this transfer method gets sent to the generic handler uh, of Chainbridge. Um, what this does is, is going to lock up 100 ample into essentially a vault. Say it's going from Ethereum to um, Polkadot, right? Um, it locks up ample onto a vault on Ethereum. Um, uh, and then when that once it happens, it uh, logs that deposit um, into the bridge logs. Um, now, when the relayers pick up this these events, they report it to the other side of the bridge. It goes through the generic handler again, and it calls a mint. So, on the target chain, um, we have <clears throat> what we call a sort of bridge secured version of Ample. Right. So, the bridge receives this transfer event, and it mints new Ample um, on the other side. Um, and so the mint ability is, uh, you know, as you can imagine, it's, it's a very important call that not everyone should be able to call. This is only callable by the bridge. This is why we call it the bridge secured version. Um, so the trust model of the ample on the remote chain is uh, purely whatever the trust model of the bridge is in this case. Um, so it mints um, a new ample uh, for the particular recipient. Um, and so that should be pretty straightforward. However, there, there's one wrinkle um, because remember we have two different jobs that are going at the same time. One is transferring of tokens and then one is the rebases that impacts everyone's balances you know, globally. Um, so you can imagine if you don't handle this correctly, you can get into some really um, scary race conditions. Um, so imagine um, you know, there is a, a positive rebase and someone is able to um, race the, the rebase function across the bridge. So say I have amples on Ethereum, I get you know, a positive expansion. So my, my 100 amples turns into 105 amples. Um, and then I immediately transfer those amples over the bridge before the rebase gets there. And then once the rebase gets there on the remote chain, I get the rebase operation again, right? So this would let me uh, double rebase um, my balance, right? Or on the opposite side, if there's a contraction, I can race in the other direction. So I can wait for a contraction to happen on Ethereum, and I can immediately send from the remote chain back to Ethereum uh, before the negative rebase applies to, to my balance on the remote chain. So that way I'm able to escape contractions. Um, so that's something that we need to make sure to avoid, right? So this goes back to why we use the generic handler, because to solve this problem, we include you know, one extra piece of data, which is um, the supply at which the transfer um, happens, right? So you can see this, um, the, the data here on, on step one is um, transfer 100 amples at 50 million. So that's the total supply. Um, so if by the time it's, um, you know, interpreted on the other side of the bridge, if the total supply is now 55 million, that 100 ample will actually be um, 110 ample. That, that will be received just because that would be that would have been 110 ample on the base chain as well. Um, so this is how the rebase works. Um, the rebase is a simple transaction or function call. Um, uh, it should be pretty straightforward if you just imagine it being a um, generic handled transaction. Um, except there is, uh, you know, one other. Uh, job that we do in the Ample system. Um, and that is, um, we have this, you know, I guess, fourth module in the system called an orchestrator that you can see uh, within the, the box on the left here and, and also on the right. 
Um, and what this does is whenever a rebase happens, it notifies downstream uh, consumers of the rebase event. So this is useful for, for some platforms that are you know not able or not yet able to support Ample. Um, they need to be notified to sort of update their accounting. So for example, Uniswap um, and balancer pools of Ample, they need to be notified that rebase happens so they can update their accounting and remain up to date with the actual balances um, underneath. Uh, so the orchestrator is just a generic um, function relayer or tra transaction relayer. So it stores a list of transactions that just executes one by one uh, when the rebase happens. Um, and so on the remote chain too, we also have a similar component called um, the essentially the orchestrator um, in case it needs to you know, update some some uh, platforms on the remote chain as well. Um, so I, I guess that's the only other wrinkle around rebases um, is just this sort of um, orchestrator call. Um, now, of course, the architecture on, on each side, um, we sort of uh, abstract away as much as we can the particular details of bridges um, because we want the, the bridge secured version of Ample to be able to sort of be a uh, perennial and sort of evolve with the space. And so as, you know, you know, bridge technology evolves too. Ample can sort of um, roll with the um, innovations as it happens. Um, yeah, so that's all I had planned to talk about. Um, some of you have probably heard of what we're doing before. Um, some of you not. So I'm really happy to talk about what we were doing. And then I'm glad I could get into the details of the chain here. Um, let's see. I think there's some time left. Can we do questions or are there any questions in the chat or anything like that? And yeah, we do have uh, we do have a few questions, but I just wanted to thank you for for taking the time uh, to speak with us today. Uh, and we're really excited about the potential synergy between uh, Ample and Chainbridge. And you know, when we started to design the generic message handler, this is exactly the type of use cases that, that we had kind of envisioned as like mm -hmm. the scenario for for Chainbridge. Um, but we do have some, some question and answer. Um, sure. Yeah, we're also super excited about the work that you're doing. Um, I think the ecosystem has the potential of getting very complicated, but with the systems you're building, I think it becomes manageable. So it, is, it's, it unlocks a lot of different sort of experimentations and building that I think is going to be really exciting to see. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, so so some, one of the audience members is, is looking for clarity. So they say, so is Ample only as volatile as the market condition for the day? If market, market conditions are stable, Ample is stable and vice versa. Um, yeah, so I guess it depends on uh, how you define volatility and stability here. Uh, so there, there's kind of two dimensions for Ample. One is the supply and then one is the price of the individual token. Um, essentially, the, the protocol um, attempts to shift volatility from unit price to supply. So the, the overall supply or you know, market cap long-term could vary wildly while the, the price of the individual token could stay within a band around the price target. So, you know, roughly $1. Um, and so um, the, the, the protocol has no direct impact on price. Price is purely determined by the marketplace. Um, what the protocol can control is the supply and then it relies on the marketplace to, you know, reinterpret this supply back into the price. Yeah, that definitely clarifies it. Thank you. Um, yeah. So somebody else is also asking, what chains are you most interested in integrating next? Yeah, so I think um, <clears throat> I think so. There's lots of really interesting um, projects out there right now, and it seems like all of them seem to be coming to market around the same time, um, and they offer sort of different trade-offs and different you know existing use cases or, or engagements. Um, Given the nature of this work, like it's potentially um, uh, the security model is very complicated. Um, and it's potentially very dangerous to to do this kind of thing if you get it wrong. And so I think we're most interested in doing the least risky integrations first. Uh, so Ample is a sort of permissionless asset. So it doesn't have to be us that sort of does these deployments. Um, but I think it's, it's good for us to do the first few to set the pattern of how it's going to work. Um, so I think the the I think is you know just from a purely development perspective anything that's since we're just already on Ethereum anything that is 
as similar to Ethereum as possible is a great candidate for a first deployment. Um, so we recently um, uh, announced this week that we're, we have specific plans to um, deploy and work with the teams for uh, Tron, uh, Polkadot, and Near, and specifically the college chain within Polkadot. Okay. Um, and so I think uh, because the similarities between Tron and Ethereum, I think that might, uh, it's most likely going to happen first. Um, and also I think they have an, perhaps the most um, number of users and highest level of engagement of a platform outside of Ethereum. So I think uh, we're also kind of excited to bring Ample to the new audience there as well. I think it's a yeah, very, very prudent approach. Um, yeah, uh, but we do like, um, we don't want to deploy or integrate with the chain just to say that we did like we do want to go into an ecosystem where Ample can be used, you know, for its desired um, uses, which is, you know, this piece of collateral or base money, something that can unlock, you know, borrowing and lending, safe contract denomination and everything that you sort of see in DeFi today. Um, so I think, uh, you know, those three um, have the potential of, of doing that. So a caller, for example, um, we're going to be supported as a um, first class fee token. So you'll be able to pay for your transactions with Ample and will also um, be supported on, on the DEXs there and hopefully um, on their um, stable coin system as well. So next question looks uh, looks a bit more technical. Um, so is the uh, is the time of the rebase execution deterministic? Can individuals know if the rebase the rebase will produce the price ahead of time or, and sell prior? So arbitrage opportunities uh, might exist as a result of that. Um, exactly. Yeah. So it's it's um, it happens within a twenty minute window. So between two a.m. and two twenty a.m. UTC. Um, um, the rebase has to happen within that window. If it misses that window, then it doesn't happen for that day. Um, so what this does is it guarantees, you know, um, complete transparency and full market, full market knowledge to everyone involved. Right. So everyone has sort of equal access to information. Um, um, and you know, the purpose of the rebase too is so. Yeah. Obviously, there are arbitrage opportunities, and we think that helps lead the system back to its sort of um, equilibrium state over time. Um, uh, and then, yeah, the purpose of the, we designed the rebase function not to immediately bring the price back to the target, right? Because um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to assume the least amount of information possible of the marketplace. It, we just wanted to set the conditions such that the, the sort of directions uh, or the slope of the system always points back to um, equilibrium. And as long as everyone knows that, then eventually it will sort of reinforce that behavior. Um, so the next question is surrounding Chainbridge. So how is the process of uh, integrating Chainbridge? Um, it's been good so far. It's been good. Um, I think it it provides a, a very you know solid framework to work from. Um, uh, the Chainbridge team has been really responsive too. So when we had particular questions or uh, you know uh, just like technical small technical changes here and there that were sort of required to support the use case. Um, everything was was um, very smooth. So um, yeah, I think uh, Chainbridge provides, um, it's very easy in the beginning if you want to start with a very centralized, very predictable system. Um, they can sort of gradually sort of move towards decentralization over time. And so we really like that property a lot. Um, and so yeah, Chainbridge has been you know, a, a sort of great project to, to work with so far. Thank you. Um, and so finally, what inspired Ample in the first place? Curious if it had anything to do with your previous project or experience. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, the easy but honest answer is, is Bitcoin, right? So, um, uh, you know, both me me and Evan were sort of exposed to Bitcoin in the early days of you know, crypto, when it's just called Bitcoin. Um, uh, uh, you know, I also co-wrote the, the first um, Bitcoin wallet that was released on the Android Play Store back in 2011. So I've been really interested in uh, the sort of the space of government independent monies for a long time. I think it's really fascinating and just the idea that you can create something like a new precious metal or a new, you know, independent money like this um, is kind of magical. And so um, once, once Ethereum launched, then it seemed like there was finally the abilities for us to solve what we thought were the biggest drawbacks of you know bitcoin and also you know fixed supply currencies um and so that's when we really started um thinking seriously about you know starting a project like ample fourth originally it's called fragments if you've heard of fragments 
um, it was a much more complicated system relying on, you know, interlocking markets of, of bonds in, in reserves and whatnot. Um, but as we worked with it more and more, we decided that, hey, um, these things are actually uh, very fragile. And so we wanted to create something that was um, as simple and you know, sort of predictable um, as, as possible. And so that's what sort of, you know, led us to, to, to Ample and you know, implementing it. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks again for, for taking the time to speak with us today, uh, Brendan. We're really looking forward to uh, kind of Ample coming into its own and, and you know, working uh, with you moving forward. Um, so. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. It was a lot of fun and i um, happy to, glad I could talk to all the Chainsafe folks. Of course, of course. Awesome. Yep. Talk to you soon. Bye. Um, so if you, yeah, awesome. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, so next, we will be hearing from a couple of more of our very dear friends from the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, Ken and Emily uh, will be speaking with us. Uh, they're going to be giving us a talk called ESP for You and Me. How are you doing, Ken? Good to see you. Yeah. Yes, well. Awesome. I like this. Uh, camera you have uh far away. yeah it's kind of like our um boardroom in the office so i'm just gonna add emily now okay awesome hey all right y'all take it away cool uh let me go ahead and share my screen let's see Okay, cool. You should be able to see my screen. Um, thank you for the quick introduction. Um, again, my name is Emily Guidry. I'm here from the Ethereum Foundation, specifically the ecosystem support team. I'm here with Ken Ng. Um, we're just gonna talk to you a little bit about like what is ESP, if you've never heard of us, hopefully this will be a nice introduction. And if you have, um, hopefully there'll be a little more new information for you to see what we've been working on this year. All right. So the ecosystem support program is um, a branch of the Ethereum Foundation, like I said before. Um, and the Ethereum Foundation's mission is to do what's best for Ethereum's long-term success. So to fulfill that mission, the EF undertakes three main roles. To allocate, which is to allocate resources to critical projects, um, to be a voice, a valued voice within the Ethereum ecosystem, and to advocate for Ethereum to the outside world. So the ecosystem support program is just one of the ways that the Ethereum Foundation pursues that first goal of allocating resources to critical projects. Um, to be more specific, we connect individuals and teams at any stage of development with a broad range of support, whether that means grants, technical feedback, um, introductions, free access to tools and platforms, or even just a friendly conversation and a nudge in the right direction. Um, so, I've said support a lot already, but when I say support, it could mean like financial grants, like I mentioned before. Um, again, like project idea validation, um, community feedback, uh, project coordination, introductions, applicable credits, um, alternative funding sources, like we can point you to like DAOs or community funds that we think would be a better fit or would also be um, willing to contribute to your project. Um, when I'm the point I'm trying to get to is that like the grants program has changed probably since the last time you've heard about it. We really were only focused on traditional financial grants and we've worked hard to expand our offerings to really try to like better serve the community and figure out what exactly it is you need to succeed with your project. So this brings me to my next slide. Who is eligible for support? That's a question we get all the time. You know, can I apply? Who is eligible? Is my project appropriate? Um, so the answer is anyone who is involved with Ethereum could receive a grant from the Ethereum Foundation, but we do have minimum requirements for projects that receive traditional monetary grants and the more in-depth forms of like alternative types of support. So the minimum requirements for a traditional monetary grants, so if we're giving you money, it needs to be open source. 
um, your project. It Your project needs to benefit Ethereum in some way. Um, and it needs to focus on either universal tools, um, infrastructure, research, or common resources. So there are some no's that we run into sometimes. Um, we don't really like to say no. We really like to try to figure out um, any way that we can help um, people in the community. Um, but things that really um, we balk at is like, we, we're not gonna help pump or help sell your token. Um, we're not gonna invest in like your new plant fund. We're not gonna fund your totally unrelated to Ethereum business. So I think you kind of get the picture when I talk about the no's, um, but I wanna point out like the nuance here. You know, no, we probably aren't going to fund your token or directly fund your DAP. But like if in making the process, in the process of making this DAP or um, or whatever you're making, you create a free and open source dev tool that maybe would be really useful to other people or other projects in the ecosystem and they'd be able to access that. That's something we'd be interested in funding. Um, cool. So. Um, how to apply. Um, applying for the, um, like, applying for a grant or just to get in touch with ESP is pretty easy. So first things first, um, this page is not an application, it's more of an inquiry. So you're not necessarily applying for a grant, you're just getting in touch with us to kick off the conversation. So you go to our website, um, ecosystem dot support or ESP dot Ethereum dot foundation. Um, you click on the button that says contact us. You want to submit an inquiry. And from there, it's going to ask you if you are inquiring about a specific project or if you're just exploring possibilities. And there's a pretty important difference between the two um, specific project. Please select that. If you know what you're working on, you just really need help with X, Y or Z um, or, you know, when you click that button, when you are exploring a specific project, really try to frame it as like, what can ESP do for you? If you're asking for something specific, please just lay it out. Let us know what you need. Let us know what you want, what you think will be useful. But, you know, if you don't know the answer to what you need, that's fine. We can explore that with you. Um, for exploring possibilities, this is um, the choice that you pick if you don't really know where to get started. Like you have a skill. Um, that you think could be useful. You just really want to contribute, dig in. You're really excited about Ethereum, but you aren't sure where to start. Exploring possibilities, where to go, and we'll get in touch and kind of like talk with you a little bit. So if you are anxious about putting in an inquiry or if you just really want more information about what the process is going to look like, you can go to our website. Again, that's esp.ethereum.foundation. Um, you can click on our page. It's called the ESP Guide. And we've really broken down um, a little more specifics about the program, like how ESP works, our mission, our goals. Or you can figure out, uh, look into more about the process. So like more information on the details of like the where your grant is going to travel through the different checks and balances, different different ways we like vet um, applicants and different ways we figure out uh, types of support. So hopefully you find that useful. We put that together this year. So just a really simple explanation of uh, what's going to happen when you submit an inquiry. Um, so you've been to our website, you submit the form. The next step, you, we do intake and initial review. You're gonna get an email from us confirming that we did um, indeed receive your application. If for some reason you don't receive that email, please contact us, that means something has gone wrong. Um, but generally you will receive that email, we'll get in touch and we'll just really kick off the conversation, trying to feel out like what it is you need, um, what does success will look like for your project, what are your goals, desired outcomes, You know, what's the intended impact um, that you have. And then from there, we move on to identifying support opportunities. You know, we work we work together to find the best ways to help you succeed. Usually that does involve like getting on call with the ESP team, like one on one um, to try to just give a little more of a personal touch and really understand what's going on. Um, so from that point, paths really diverge depending on the type of support you receive, if you receive you know, if you're going to receive application credits, then we'll pass those on to you. If you are potentially um, eligible for a traditional grant, then you will likely be submitting a more in-depth proposal. There's a couple different paths you can take. And again, we illustrate that a little more clearly on our website at the ESP guide. 
So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Ken um, for our next section. Ken? Thanks, Emily. Um, now that the harder stuff is done, I can talk about the fun stuff. Um, so uh, some of the stuff that we've been working on, and I guess over the past two-ish years now, um, you know, we always want to improve and iterate based on what people have told us, uh, you know, reviews on you know, how the grants program is going, how uh, so the level of support we're providing, is it helpful, is it not helpful, um, and really trying to adapt what uh, the students needs are based on what we can offer and if we don't offer it, how can we continue to offer it? So to the nitty gritty of what people like to see, uh, the flashy stuff is the numbers. Uh, in 2020, we've supported 123 projects. Sorry, the hesitation is one, two, three. Um, and it's a mix between traditional grants, so financial support and alternative support, so anything in between. Um, in 2020, uh, it's about a 60-40 split of uh, financial support to traditional grants and 40% of non-financial support or alternative support, um, which I think is a huge improvement over kind of what we've done in the past, where instead of you know just flat out saying no with ESP and then kind of with our um, you know, more holistic approach now, we're able to really kind of break down what exactly it is that each team is uh, trying to accomplish and how we can, you know, uh, accomplish it together, or if that's not it, what it is that we can uh, achieve. Um, some of the things that we've really kind of uh, built upon and, and tried to improve uh, based on the feedback is, you know, working on internal coordination, right? Uh, I think across uh, even the EF, uh, communication is, is there, uh, but coordination is always still the hardest problem. Um, so we've kind of increased the greater uh, increase the amount of communication we have with internal teams within the EF, just so we can understand their needs better, uh, whether that is you know their roadmap or coordinating with other teams and, and other uh, teams within the ecosystem, not just uh, local to EF. It's understanding how we can actually help here and how we can assist them. Um, we're conducting internal interviews to know how we're actually affecting them, right? We don't want to work in a vacuum and we try not to work in a vacuum. So how does this actually impact their work and how does their work impact us and how do we adjust uh, our funding priorities based on their roadmaps? Um, additionally, we have the pin board up on the ESP website, which is um, a good kind of like a, a bulletin board of uh, things you can work on. So getting input from other teams within EF to tell us what we can put on the bulletin board. Imagine in high school and university when you have the giant boards in the hallway outside of class and people put up flyers like, I need help with this, my piano teacher, or you know, ET bounties. Uh, same thing, pretty much. Um, there's also the grantee experience. You know, one of the things that we always try to stress is how do we actually uh, talk to applicants and grantees? How do we make sure that you know we can help make everything better uh, when things are not great, right? Um, you know, the, the best thing that we can do is provide good customer service, even if you know, the results aren't um, exactly what everyone expects. So we've implemented end of grant surveys uh, to understand how the process went. Uh, operationally, you know, are there any hiccups? How do we improve upon that? Uh, we have regular, uh, regular and automated checking cadence. Uh, that way, you know, uh, even if we don't follow up, it makes sure that everyone else can follow up with us. Um, that way, you know, if there are any problems that come about, uh, we can you know nip it in the bud as soon as possible. We have internal SLAs to keep each other in check. We keep each other accountable to make sure that you know, if one person uh, doesn't respond to an email, someone else can. We don't drop the ball on anything, um, or at least we try not to. Uh, we also have community engagement. This is the thing that's, I think, closest to my heart. It's making sure that we have uh, inclusiveness and diversity and, and making sure that we're not just funding you know, core protocol. It's, it's everything else in between that advances the Ethereum ecosystem. We have a local grants program uh, that's funded uh, projects in, in Korea and Taiwan uh, in Honduras uh, most recently. Um, and that'll keep growing. Uh, we've increased presence at hackathons and events like this one. Um, and uh, we have more frequent blog posts. We're re-bringing that back and we're trying to be as open and as transparent with uh, as much as we can. Um, 
So we're making sure that you know if we don't keep each other in check, uh, we let the community keep us in check. Um, so yeah, uh, want to dive into also examples of past support uh, because your success is our success. Uh, everything that we do is for the ecosystem and the community. Uh, so in talking about non-financial support, you know, success itself is, is very subjective, right? Uh, we know that some problems are more accomplishable than others, and we know that everyone has different needs. It's unfair for us to kind of say, you know, if you can get this far, this is what we need to accomplish. Um, it's not really fair if we don't get there, right? It's not to say that if you can't accomplish a goal, you're a complete failure and never talk to us again, right? Ethereum is hard. Uh, eat too much, you know, or uh, we have, Serenity. So, you know, we understand there are hard problems and a lot of these are going to be hard problems. It doesn't mean that you're a success. Success is a bar that we have to continue to change uh, and make sure that, you know, whatever needs you have and obstacles you're facing, we can help address them. Um, so part of our, our uh, goal here for ESP is not just helping to achieve these goals, but actually understanding, helping to articulate what are the challenges that you are facing uh, so we can best leverage our resources, everything that we have at our disposal to make sure that we can dress it together. Uh, one really good example uh, is post on support. So obviously due to COVID, we've had a lot of virtual events, a lot of virtual hackathons. Um, and you know we speak at most of these, uh, and they come to us afterwards, uh, which we love. Um, and the the biggest question we get is, what do we do now? Uh, it, it's a good question. You know, it, you you build something after a month or a weekend, and you're so passionate about this, and we want to harness that enthusiasm. We want to make sure that whatever it is that you've built, we can continue pushing forward on. So, I think um, coming out of a hackathon you can go out and get public goods funding, right? Whether it is a tool that you're building or it's a DAP, um, there are so many meta allocators or uh, alternative allocators like ClearFund, like Gitcoin Grants. Um, they'll set you up, they'll make sure that you know you can tell the community what it is that you're building and how you can get funded from it with CLR matching. Um, you know, if you are from a non-English, non-native English speaking country or if you don't, speak English uh, fluently, uh, there's translation help, right? You can go to community groups like ePlanet or ECN to get your uh, 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 docs or, or anything translated. Uh, and there's more, right? There's local communities in Latin America, uh, in, in Poland. Um, there's so many community groups out there you can tap into, and we can make those connections if you don't already know them. Uh, one big thing that we get a lot is the murky waters of auditors. How do you get your thing audited? Uh, nothing, your dApps audited. Uh, there's Chainsafe, right? There's so many auditors that we can kind of list out and that we're connected to. We can make sure that you know you have the right people or you actually have a list of uh, auditors that you can talk to and sort of get quotes from. Um, there's also mentorship and incubation. Uh, projects like Meta Cartel are always open to receiving uh, more projects to work with. Um, there's also alternative funding opportunities. Maybe the EF is a good uh, funding opportunity. Maybe we're a good funding source, but you know sometimes we're not. Uh, we can help connect you with other funding sources, ranging from UNICEF to Malik Dow. There are so many different people out there uh, who can support different projects, who have different missions. Um, and if you don't know it, we're more than happy to connect you with them and make sure that you do get off on the right foot. Jumping into sort of the more recent ones, um, on our blog, on, on our website, you can see some feature projects that we have posted up there. So TurboGet, Uniswap, Circum, ETH on ARM, Ethers.js, and Nethermind, all amazing projects that we've worked with, we've supported, uh, and you know we love for them to kind of talk about what they're doing so other applicants and, and uh, other grantees sort of see that. Uh, we're going to update that soon and have more projects, um, so keep an eye out. Uh, we also have the ESP blog. Again, that's back. Uh, we just posted our Q3 quarterly allocation update, um, so check that out. Uh, but all of our 2020 quarterly allocation updates are there. You can check out everything that we've done for the whole year. Um, we have ESP Beyond Grants. What else do we do uh, for a deeper dive into our non-financial support? Um, we have a call for applications, uh, talking about ESP in general, and then we have the Taiwan Grant, grant Wave. Uh, 
discussing our uh, local grants program. So I think what I want to end with here is, you know, we want to do as much as we can to help the ecosystem. Um, and there are still things that we have yet to uncover. So if you don't know what you need, but you know that you need help, come to us and we'll find, we'll figure it out together. We'll find out what it is that that is. Uh, and if we don't have it already, we'll find someone or we'll figure out how we can get it. Um, but yeah, that's it. Tell us what you're working on um, at our website, esp.ethereum.foundation. You can email us as well, esp.ethereum.org, or tweet at us at ef underscore esp. Uh, check out our newsletter. Sign up for it. It's good. I think that is all. But we can begin Q&As. Cool. Do you have something to say, Emily? Okay. Nope, just was making sure my screen share went down. Awesome. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for both of you, uh, Emily and Ken, taking the time to speak with us today. Um, yeah, it was a great presentation. Thanks also for your ongoing support of ChainSafe. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are today uh, without the, the support of the EF. Um, and an extra big shout out to Ken for rocking the ETH Waterloo shirt. <laughs> here, yeah, you'll, you'll make some fans wearing a shirt like that around here, uh, especially once Mr. Gregory. That's what I did to pump myself up. I wore my <laughs> Waterloo shirt, listened to some Drake. Uh, I'm, I'm all about it. Very topical. I like it. Um, so we do have a couple, a few audience questions for you. Uh, so as mentioned, as you mentioned, the grants program has already gone through changes. What changes would you like to see in the future, and how would you like those changes? How would you like to see those changes benefiting the Ethereum ecosystem? Ken? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think when we set out to kind of, uh, you know, think about priorities and, and higher level kind of goals for the ecosystem, it's hard for us to say for certain that, you know, one path is really how the ecosystem is going to go. Um, you know, it, it's, Timelines, roadmaps, all of this continue to change. So, you know, what we want to do is be as open as possible. And so that's kind of how we transition sort of from the uh, EF grants program to the ecosystem support program. It's understanding our, I guess, um, lack of full overview in the ecosystem that lets us sort of be more open into accepting all different projects, right? As Emily said, you know, we don't just have, uh, you know, specific projects, we also have exploring possibilities because we just don't know exactly what it is that the rest of the ecosystem needs. It allows us to kind of understand the trends of where people are going. Um, you know, I think we're, uh, we try to be on Twitter and, and try to be on Reddit, but at the end of the day, we're, we're just a team. Um, so the inbound applications allow us to really look at what people are thinking about, what's really important for the ecosystem, and sort of we always shift our focus from there. Um, but at the end of the day, we don't know what we don't know. So um, if we don't offer it now, or if we don't fund it now, I think having an open application process allows us to field all of this and allows us to be more proactive about how we can adapt the funding needs of the ecosystem according to what uh, the community actually wants and, and really values. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, what is the most exciting project that was kickstarted through the grants program? That's like the hardest question in the world. <laughs> it's like picking a favorite child. Yeah, you can't pick Honestly, a favorite child. No, you can't. Each of you can, can offer one that you kind of is most dear to each of you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to say that we do um, to avoid this exact scenario where we pick our favorite grantees, we do have our site um, okay. where we feature like post featured projects um, where we try to keep those like on rotation to give everyone a little bit more particular spotlight. So I will just like direct everyone to that page, which we are hoping to update in early 2020, um, even though that's a major deflection. But um, yeah, very no. diplomatic. Well done. Ken. <laughs> Uh, can I say the same? If, yeah, if sure. I can't say the same, I'm going to say, you know, ChainSafe is a grantee of ours. Okay, we support we them. They're <laughs> such amazing grantees. That's a good yeah. one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and so finally, uh, do you help projects slash teams develop plans to become sustainable after their grants uh, expire slash funds are depleted? You kind of touched on this, but maybe you want to go into it a little bit more. Yeah, that's a really good question. So sustainability is 
a really kind of hard question, right? Because what what exactly is sustainable and what is a Web3 business model, right? These are all questions we're still sort of uncovering and still trying to understand how we can, um, you know, really make uh, a standard for or not a standard and, and have some sort of blueprint for. The answer is that there's no, there's no good blueprint for that right now, right? Um, sustainability is making sure that um, you know, teams can survive. They can, they can, you know, uh, have <laughs> a house to live in and, and to have food to eat. Uh, but for others, sustainability is, is having like a six to 12 to 18 months runway. So a lot of this is, is really subjective. And what we do is we really try to work with each team to understand what their funding needs are and what, what actually they do need to move forward. Um, you know, what's the next step in your process? What's the next level that you're trying to reach? Uh, is it, you know, are you looking for VC funding? Are you looking for more grants? Are you looking for, um, you know, just build a project and and leave it off to the community to, to maintain? All of these are, are sort of different and, and there's no, um, yeah, there's no blueprint and there's no standard way of actually kind of listing this out there. I think the most important thing is making sure that each team has a good roadmap, um, you know, understanding where the where it is that they want to go within a certain time frame within the grant scope, it can be another grant. Um, you know, perpetually being funded by grants is, is something that some teams do as well. Um, the idea is that it would be unfair for us to you know claim that there is only one answer for this. Right, sustainability is having you know X months of runway. Um, so yeah, there's there's no good answer. It's hard, it's hard, but we're willing to work with teams to figure out what exactly that means, where you want to go, and we'll level set from there. I mean, I guess like so many complicated questions, the answer is always Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, again, thanks very much for joining us uh, today, taking your time out of your day to, to share this with us. Um, and I, I, again, for, for your ongoing support of Change City. Much, much appreciated. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. It's been us. a pleasure. Take care. Um, so we're going to take a short break. Um, my time of moderation has come to an end. And uh, when we return, uh, we'll be hosted by our CEO, uh, Aiden Hyman. Uh, so again, just a reminder, if you like the content you see, please tweet about it using the hashtag CSCon. Um, and please retweet our tweets. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, Great spending some time with some amazing speakers this morning, uh, this morning Toronto time anyway. And yeah, look forward to see everybody else this afternoon.